Okay, welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 22 here in our live studio performance here on stage in Palo Alto. I'm Sean Furrier, your host with theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host. We've got a great industry ecosystem panel to discuss whether it's real or hype. David McJanet, CEO of HashiCorp, hugely successful company, as Will LaForest, field CTO at Confluent, and Victoria Villarengo from VMware. Guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So, real or hype, SuperCloud, David. Well, I think it depends on the definition. <laughs> okay, how do you define super cloud? <laughs> Start there. Uh, so I think we have a, I think we have a, like a, an inherently pragmatic view of super cloud, of the idea of super cloud as you talk about it, which is, um, you know, for those of us that have been in the infrastructure world for a long time, we know there are really only six or seven categories of infrastructure. There's sort of the infrastructure, security, networking, databases, middleware, and and um, <clears throat> and and really the message queuing aspects. And I think our view is that. If the steady state of the world is multi-cloud, what you've seen is sort of some modicum of standardization across those different elements. You know, take you know, take uh, Confluent. You know, I, I worked in the middleware world years ago. Uh, MQ series and uh, typical multicast was how you did message queuing. Well, you don't do that anymore. All the different cloud providers have their own message queuing tech. There's Google PubSub and the equivalents across the, the different different clouds. Kafka has provided a consistent way to do that, and they're not trying to project that you can run everything connected. They're saying hey, you should standardize on Kafka for message queuing because that way you can have operational consistency. So I think to me, that's more how we think about it is sort of there is sort of layer by layer uh, sort of de facto standardization for the lingua franca. So a streaming super cloud is how you would think of it? Or, no, I, I just, <laughs> or a component of That could be cloud. a super cloud. I just, I just think that there are, like, if I'm going to build an application, message queuing is going to be a necessary element of it. I'm going to use ka Kafka, not you know, a native pub sub engine on one of the clouds because operationally that's just the only way I can do it. So I think that's more our view, it's much more pragmatic rather than trying to create like a single platform that you can run everywhere and deal with the, the networking realities yeah. of like network, you know, hops missing across those different worlds and have that be our responsibility. It's much more around, hey, let's standardize at each layer operationally. Standardized layer that you can use to build a super cloud if that's in your, your intent? Or, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Okay. And it reminds me of the web services days, you kind of do the throwback there. I mean, we're kind of living the next gen of web services, the dream of that next level because DevOps, DevSecOps now has now gone mainstream. That's the big challenge we're hearing. Devs are doing great, yep. but the ops teams and security, they got to go faster. This seems to be a core, I won't say blocker, but more of a drag to the innovation. <clears throat> well, you know, I'll, I'll just get off, I'll hand it off to, to you guys, but I think the idea that like, you know, if I'm going to have an app that's running on Amazon that needs to connect to a database that's running on, on the private data center, that's essentially the SOA, SOA notion, you know, writ large <laughs> that we're all trying to solve 20 years ago. But it's much more complicated because you're brokering different identity models, different networking models, it's just much more complex. So that's where the ops bit is the constraint. You know, for me to build that app not that complicated. For the ops person to let it see traffic is another thing altogether. And I think that's, that's the break point for so much of what looks easy to, to a developer is the operational reality of how you do that. And the good news is those are actually really well solved problems. They're just not broadly understood. Well, what's your take? You talk to customers all the time, field CTO, Confluent, really doing yeah. well, streaming data. I mean, everyone's doing it now, they have to. Yeah. These are new things that pop up that need solutions. You guys step up and doing more. What's your take on SuperCloud? Well, I mean, the way we address it, honestly, is we don't, if you're going to be honest, we don't think about SuperCloud, much less is the fact that SaaS is really being pushed down. Like, we rewound seven years ago and you took a look at SaaS, like it was obvious if you were going to build a product for an end consumer or business user, you'd do SaaS. You'd be crazy not to, <laughs> right? But seven years ago, if you look at your average software company uh, producing something for a developer, the people building those apps, chances are you had an open source model yeah. um, or you know self-managed. Um, I think with the success of a lot of the companies that are here today, you know, Snowflake, um, Databricks, Confluent, it's, uh, it's obvious that SaaS is the way to deliver software to the developers as well. And as such, because our product is um, uh, provided that way to the developers across the clouds, that's, that's how they have a unifying data layer, right? They don't necessarily, you know, developers, like many people, don't necessarily want to deal with the infrastructure. They just want to consume <laughs> cloud native services, right? So that's how we help our customers span cloud. So we Traditionally, that SaaS was going to be either built on a single cloud or in the case of service now, they built their own cloud, right? So increasingly, we're seeing Salesforce. opportunities to build a, a Salesforce as well. Across clouds, tap different, well. different, different services. So 
so how does that evolve? Do you, some clouds have you know better capabilities than other clouds. So how does that all get sort of adjudicated? Do you do you devolve to the lowest common denominator, or can well, you take the best of all of each? The whole point to that, I think, is that when you move from the business user and the personal consumer to the developer, you, you can no longer be on a cloud, right? There has to be locality to where applications are being developed. So we can't just deploy on a single cloud and have people send their data to that cloud. We have to be where the developer is. And our job is to make yep. the most of each and individual cloud to provide the same experience to them, right? So yes, we're using the capabilities of each cloud, but we're hiding that to the developer. They don't, shouldn't need to know or care, right? Okay, and you're hiding that with the subtraction layer. We talked about this before, Vittorio. And that, that layer has, what, some intelligence that has metadata knowledge that can adjudicate what, what the best, where the best you know, services or a function of latency or data sovereignty. How do you see that? Well, I think the, you need to instrument these applications so that you, you, you can get that data and then make intelligent decision of where, where, where this the deployed application. I think what Dave said is, is right, you know, the, the level of super cloud that they're talking about is the standardization across messaging and, and how you, what's happening within the application, right? So you don't, you are not too dependent on the underlying. But then the application say that it takes a, uh, the, the form of a, of a microservice, right? And you deploy. Then it has, there has to be a way for operator to say, okay, I, I see all these, um, microservices running across clouds, and I can factor out how they're performing, uh, how I, I life, life cycle manage and all that. And so I think there is, there is to me, there's the next level of the super cloud is how you factor this out so an operator can actually put, keep up with the developers and make sense of all that and manage it. Like we, just yeah, you guys, it, it, we see it all the do. time. Like, it, but it's also like, that's what Datadog does. So Datadog basically yeah. allows you to instrument all those services on-prem, private data center, you know, all the different clouds to have a consistent view. I think that's another good example of a vendor that's created a, a sort of a level of standardization across a layer. Um, and I think that's, that's more how we think about it. I think the notion of like a developer building an application they can deploy and not have to worry where it exists yeah. is more of a PaaS kind of construct. You know, things like Cloud Foundry have done a great job of, of doing that. But underneath that, there's still infrastructure, there's still security, there's still networking underneath it. And I think that's where, you know, things like Confluent and you know, us yeah. perhaps at the infrastructure layer have standardized. But you have an off the shelf PaaS, if I could call it that, yep. kind of plain vanilla. And then you have PaaS, and I think about, you mentioned Snowflake. Snowflake is, with Snowpark seems to be developing a PaaS layer that's purpose built for their specific purpose of sharing data and governing data across multiple clouds, uh, you know, call it super PaaS. Is, is that a prerequisite of a, a super cloud? You, you're building blocks, I'm hearing. Yeah. for super cloud. Is that a prerequisite for super cloud that's different than the no. paths of 10 years ago? No, but I, but I think this, this is, they're just different layers. So it's like, I, I don't know how the, the, the Snowflake offering is built, built, but I would guess it's probably built on Terraform and Vault and Console underneath it, because those are the ingredients with respect to how you would build a composite application that runs across multiple clouds. And that's, how that's, Oracle, how. that's how Oracle with the Microsoft announcement they just, they just made. If you saw that, that was built on Terraform. Right? Yeah. But, but, but they would claim that they, they did some special things within their past that were purpose built for, to for sure. low latency, for example. For They're sure. not going to build that on you know, OpenShift as an, as an example. They're going to you know, do their own little you know, mechanics. For sure, for sure. Um, so I think what you're, what you're pointing at and what Victoria was talking about is, hey, can a vendor provide a consistent experience across the application layer across these multiple clouds? And I would say, sure. Just like you know, you might build a mobile banking application that has a front end on Amazon and the back end running on vSphere on your private data center, sure. But the ingredients you use to do that have to be, they can't be the cloud native aspects for how you do that. How do you think about you know, the connectivity of, of like networking between that thing to this thing? Is it different on Amazon? Is it different on Azure? Is it different on, on Google? And so the, 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 the companies that we all serve, that's what they're building. They're building composite applications. Mm -hmm. Snowflake is just an example of a company that we serve that's building and, composite and, applications. And, and, but, but don't those, don't you have to hide the complexity of that, those, those cloud native primitives? That's your job, right? Is to actually cre create simplicity across clouds, is it not? Well, I, you know, go ahead, you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that in fact is what we're doing for developers that need to do event streaming, right? Um, that need to process this data in real time. Now, we're, we're doing the sort of things that Vittorio was just talking about. Like underneath the covers, of course, you know, we're using Kubernetes and we're managing the, the differences between the clouds. Um, but we're hiding the, that and we've become sort of a de facto standard across the cloud. So if I'm developing an app in any of those clouds, and I think we all know, and you were mentioning it earlier, Every significant company is multi-cloud now. All the large enterprises. I just got back from Brazil and like every single one of them have multiple clouds and on-prem, 
right? So they need something that can span those. What's the challenge there? If you talk to those customers, because we're seeing the same thing. They have multiple clouds, yeah. but it was kind of by default or they had some use case, either .NET developers there with Azure, they'll do whatever cloud. And it's kind of seems specialty relative to the cloud native that they're on. What problems do they have? Because the complexity to run infrastructure as code across clouds is hard, right? So the trade up between native cloud and have better integration to complexity of multiple clouds seems to be a topic around super cloud. What are you seeing for, for uh, issues that they might have or concerns? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it is, it is hard to actually, so here's the thing that I think is kind of interesting though, by the way, is that I, I think we tend to, you know, if you're, if you're from a technical background, you tend to think of multi-cloud as a problem for the IT um, organization. Like, how do we solve this? How do we save money? But actually, it's a business problem now too, because every single one of these companies that have multiple clouds, they want to integrate their data, their products across these, and it, it's inhibiting their innovation. It's hard to do, but that's where something like, uh, you know, HashiCorp comes in, right? Is to help solve that so you can instrument it. It has to happen at each of these layers. And I suppose if it does happen at every single layer, then voila, we organically have something that amounts to super cloud, right? I love how you guys are representing each other's firms. And, uh, <laughs> so, but, but, but they also, correct me if I'm wrong, but very these, similar. your customers want to, it is very similar, but your customers want to monetize, right? They want to bring yeah. their tools, their software, their particular IP and their data and create, you know, every, every company's a software company, as you know, Andreessen says, every company's becoming a cloud company Mm -hmm. to, to monetize uh, in, in the future. Is that, is that a reasonable premise of SuperCloud? Yeah, I think, I think everyone's trying to build composite applications to, to generate revenue. Like that's, that's why they're building applications. So yeah, 100%. I was just going to make a point because we see it as well. Like it's actually quite different by geography, weirdly. So if you go to um, like different geographies, you see actually different cloud providers more represented than others. Mm -hmm. So like in North America, Amazon's pretty dominant. Japan, Amazon's pretty dominant. You go to Southeast Asia, actually it's not necessarily that way. Like it might be Google for, for whatever reason, um, more Alibaba. So this notion of multi is just the reality everyone's de everybody's dealing with. But yeah, I think everyone, Everyone goes through the same process, what we've observed, they kind of go, there's like this cloud V1 and there's cloud V2. Yeah. Cloud V1 is sort of the very tactical, let's go build something on cloud. Cloud V2 is like, whoa, 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 whoa. I now have some stuff on Amazon, stuff, some stuff on Azure, some stuff on, on vSphere, and I need some operational consistency. How do I think about zero trust across that yeah. way, in a consistent way? And that's where this conversation comes into being. It's sort of, it's not like the first version of cloud. It's actually when people step back and say, hey, yeah. hey I want to build composite applications to monetize. How am I going to do that? in an industrialized way, and that's the problem that you were sure it's not. It's not, a, it's not a no-brainer like it was with cloud. Go to the cloud, write an app, you're good. Here it's architectural systems thinking. You've yeah. got to think about regions. What's the latency? It's the you step know. back and go like, how are we going to do this, do this exactly? Like it's fine to do one app, but how do we do this at scale? Zero Trust is a great example. I mean, a Amazon kind of had, it was forced to get into the Zero Trust you know, discussion. That, that wasn't you know, even a term that they used, and now, Sort of, they're starting to talk about it, but within their domain. And so, how do you do zero trust, trust across clouds, I, to your point? I wonder if we're limiting our conversation too much to the, the very technical set of developers. Because I'm thinking back <clears throat> at, again, my example of C++ libraries, C++ libraries that makes it easier, and then Visual, ba Visual Basic, right? And right now, we don't have enough developers to build the software that we want to build. And so I want, and we're like now debating, oh, can we, do we hide that AI API from Google versus that SQL Server API from, from Microsoft? I wonder at some point, who cares, right? You know, we, I think if we want to get really economy of scale, we need to get to a level of abstraction for developers that really allows them to say, I don't really, really you know, for most of, most of the procedural application that I need to build as a developer, as a, uh, as a procedural developer, I don't care about this stuff. Some, some propeller head has done that for me, I just like, plug it in my ID and, and, and I use it. And so I don't, I don't know how far we are from that, but if we don't get to that level, it seems to me that we're never going to get really the, the economy or the cost of building application to I, that level. I was going to ask you in the previous segment about low code, you know, no code, expanding the number of developers out there. And you talk about propeller heads. That's, that's what you guys all do. Yeah. I mean, you're the technical <laughs> geniuses, right? For to solve propeller. that problem. So that, so you can have low code development. Is yeah. that? I don't a, think we have the right people here because I, we, we're still you know, <laughs> trying to solve that problem at that level. But, but that problem has to be solved first right before we can address what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I worked uh, very closely with uh, one of my biggest mentors was Adam Bosworth that um, built uh, you know, uh, the, all the APIs for uh, Visual Basics and, uh, and 
the SQL API to Visual Basic and all that stuff, and he always was on that front. In fact, his last job was at, my, at uh, AWS, building that no-code environment. So I'm a little detached from that. It just hit me as we were discussing this. It's like, maybe we're just like, Creating. But, but I, would, I would argue that you, you kind of got to separate the two layers. So yep. you think about the application platform layer that a developer interfaces to. You know, uh, Victoria and I worked together years ago, and one of the products we created was Cloud Foundry, right? So this is the idea of like, just, like, just you know, CF push, just push this app artifact, and I don't care. That's how you get the developer uh, community writ large to adopt something complicated by hiding all the complexity. And I think that that is one model. Yeah. Turns out Kubernetes is actually become a peer to that and actually perhaps become more popular and that's what you know, folks like Tanzer are trying to do. But there's another layer underneath that which is the infrastructure that supports it, right? Because yeah. that, that still needs to run on something and I think that's, that's the separation we have to do. Yes, we're talking a little bit about the plumbing but you know, we could just easily be talking about the app layer. The, you need both of them. Our point of view is you need to standardize at this layer just like you need to standardize it at this layer. Well, this is, this is infrastructure, this is DevOps. V2. Dev, ops. Yeah, and this is where I think the ops piece with open source, I would argue that open source is booming more than ever, so I think there's plenty of developers coming. The automation question becomes interesting because I think what we're seeing is shift left is proving that there's app developers out there that want to stay in their pipelining, they don't want to get in the, under the hood, they just want infrastructure as code. But then you got supply chain software issues there. We talked about the Docker con yep. big time. So developers at the top, I think are going to be fine. The question is what's the blocker? What's holding them back? And it, I don't see the devs piece, Vittorio, as much. What do you guys think? Is it, is the, is the blocker ops or is it the developer experience that's the blocker? It's both. There just aren't enough people, truthfully. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I sort of view the developer as sort of the engine of the digital innovation. So, you know, if you talk about uh, creative destruction, that's, that was the economic equivalent of software is eating the world. The developers are the ones that are doing that innovation. It's absolutely <laughs> essential that you make it super easy for them to consume, right? So I think, you know, they're nerds, they want to deal with infrastructure to some degree, but I think they understand the value of getting uh, a bag of Legos that they can construct something new around. And I think that's the key because honestly, I mean, no code may help for some things. Maybe I'm just old school, but I've, I went through this before with like Delphi and there were some other ones and, and I hated it. Like I just wanted to code, yeah. right? So. I think making them more efficient is, is absolutely key. Uh, I, but I think what, where you're going with that question is that the, the developers, they tend to stay ahead. They, they just, they're just geared, you know, wired that way, right? So I think right now, while there is a big bottleneck in developers, I think the operation team needs to catch up. Because I, I talk to these, these, these people, like our customers all the time, and I see them still stuck uh, in the old world, right? give me a bunch of VMs and I'll, I know how to manage. Well, that world, you know, although has lags, it's going to be there forever, still managing mainframe. Well, so but if they... The new world is all about microservices and containers, and if the operation team doesn't get on top of it, and the security team, mm. then, then, then they're going to be a bottleneck. Okay, I want to ask you guys, if the, if the companies can get through that knothole of having their ops teams and the dev teams work well together, what's the benefits of a super cloud? How do you see the, the outcome if you kind of architect it right, you think the big picture, you zoom out and say, what's the end game look like for super cloud? Is what, it, what I would say. What's the nirvana? <laughs> I, to me, nirvana is that you don't care. You just don't, don't care. You, know, you, you just you think when you're running a building application, let's go back to the on-prem days. You don't care if it runs on HP or Dell or, you know. I'm going to make some uh, an enemies here with my <laughs> old, old family. But you, know, you don't really care, right? What you want is the application is up and running and people can use it, right? And so I think that Nirvana is that you know, there is some, some computing power out there, some pass layer that allows me to deploy and, and build application. And I just like the build code and I deploy it and I get value at a reasonable cost. Like, I think one of the things that the super cloud, for, from, as far as we're concerned, is cost. How do you manage and monitor the cost across all this cloud, make sure that you don't, the economics don't get out of whack, right? How many companies we, we know that have gone to the cloud only to realize, that, holy crap, now I, I, I got the bill. And, and you know, I, I, as a vendor, when I was in my previous company, you know, we had a whole team figuring out how to lower our cost on the one hyperscaler that we were using. So these are, you know, the, once you have in the super cloud, you don't care, just you, you, you go with the path of least 
the best economics is. So what about the open versus closed debate? Uh, Will, you were mentioning that we had Snowflake here and Databricks is both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. You guys are building open standards across clouds. Clearly, even the, clo the walled gardens are using o open standards. But historically, de facto standards have emerged and solved these problems. So the super cloud as a de facto standard versus what Databricks is trying to do, super cloud kind of as an, as an open platform. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Can you actually have uh, an, an open set of standards that can be a super cloud for a specific purpose? Or will it just be built on open source technology? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I think open source continues to be an important part of innovation. No but question. I will say from a business model perspective, like the days, like when we started off, we were an open source company. I think that's really done, in my opinion. Because if you want to be successful nowadays, you need to provide a cloud native SaaS oriented product. It doesn't matter what's running underneath the covers. It could be commercial, closed source, open source. They just want a service and they want to use it, quite frankly. Now, it's nice to have open source because the developers can download it and run it on their laptop. But I, th I can imagine in 10 years time, actually, um, and you see most companies that are in the cloud providing SaaS, you know, free $500 credit, they may not even be doing that. They'll just, you know, go whatever cloud provider that their company is telling them to use, they'll spin up their SaaS product, they'll start playing with it, and that's how adoption will grow, right? Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, my personal view is that it's, that it's infrastructure is pervasive enough, it exists at the bottom of everything, that the standards emerge out of open source, in my view. And you think about how something like Terraform is built, just, just pick one of the layers. There's Terraform core, and then there's a plugin for everything you integrate with. All of those are open source. There are over 2,000 of these. We don't build them, right? That, and it's the same way that drove Linux standardization yeah. years ago. Like, someone had to build the drivers for every piece yeah. of hardware in the world. The market does not do that twice. The market does that once. And so I, I, I'm deeply convicted that open source is the only way that this works at the infrastructure layer because everybody relies on it. At the application layer, you may have different kinds of databases. You may have different kind of runtime environments, and that's just the nature of it. You can't have two different ways of doing network. Right. Because the stakes are so it, high, basically. It, yeah, because there's, there's an infinite number of, the surface area is just so large. So I actually worked in product development years ago for middleware, and the biggest challenge was how do you keep the adapter ecosystem up to date to integrate with everything in the world? And the only way to do it, in our view, is through open source. And I think that's a fundamental uh, philosophical view that it, we're just you know, grounded in. I think when people are making infrastructure decisions that span 20 years at the customer base, this is what they think about. They go, which standard will emerge based on the model of the vendor? And I don't think, my personal view is, is it's not possible to do in a, in a Do you think that's way. a de facto standard kind of psychological perspective or is there actual material work being done bo or both in there? It's, it, it's, it's a network effect thing, right? So, so, you know, before Google releases a new service, service on Google Cloud, as part of the release checklist is, does it support Terraform? They do that work, not us. Why? Because every one of their customers uses yep. Terraform to interface with them. And that's how it works. So, so the philosophical view of the, of the customer is, okay, what am I going to standardize on for this layer for the next 30 years? It's kind of a no-brainer philosophically. I think the standards are organically created based yeah. upon adoption. I mean, for instance, Terraform. We have a provider, we're, again, we're at the data layer, that we created for you. So like, I don't think there's a board out there. I mean, there are. That are creating standards. I think those days are kind of done, to be the, honest. The, the Terraform provider for vSphere has been downloaded five and a half million times this yeah. year, yeah. right? Like so. Yeah, I mean, these, these are unifying people. moments. These are like the de facto standards are really important process in these structural changes. I think that's something that we're looking at here with SuperCloud is what's next? What has to unify? Look what Kubernetes has done. I mean, that's essentially an easy thing to orchestrate, but people get behind it. So I see this as a big part of this next V2. Totally. What yeah. do you guys see that's needed? What's the rallying unification point? Is it the past layer? Is it more infrastructure? I guess that's the question we're trying to I, I think about. every layer will need that open source or a major uh, traction from one of the proprietary vendor. But I, I agree with David, it's going to be open source for the most part. Uh, but you know, going back to the original question of the whole panel, if I <laughs> may, uh, if this is reality of hype, look at the roster of companies that are presenting or participating yeah. today, these are all companies that have some sort of multi-cloud, cross-cloud, super-cloud play. They're either public, have real revenue, are about to go public. So the answer to the question, yeah, it's real. Yeah, and, so, then, and there's more too, we had, couldn't fit them in, but. We, we chose super-cloud on purpose because it was kind of fun, John and I kind of came up with it. And, 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 but, but do you think it's, it hurts the industry to have this, try to put forth this new term, or is it helpful to actually try to push the industry to define 
th this new term? Or should it just be multi-cloud 2.0? I mean, conceptually, it's different than multi-cloud, right? I mean, in my opinion, right? Um, so in that, in that respect, it has value. Right, because it's talking about something greater than just multi-cloud. Everyone's got multi-cloud. Well, yeah. it, to me, the multi-cloud is the, the problem, I should say, the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And super cloud, or we call it cross-cloud, is the solution to that mm -hmm. challenge. Right. Let's not call it. And we're debating that. We're debating that in our Clouderati panel where we're talking about, is multi-cloud a problem yet that needs to get solved? Or is it not yet ready for a market, to your point? Is it, so, are, we, are we in the front end of coming into the true problem I can set give you a definite answer to that. Yeah, the ahead. answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you look yes. at the customers that yeah. are there, they want that have gone yeah. through the euphoria phase, they're all like, holy, something. What, what are we going to do about this, right? <laughs> and then, but they don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the more advanced ones, as the vendor. Look, at the end of the day, markets are created by vendors that build software that customers want to buy yeah. but, but because they get value. It, and, and, and it's nuanced, but in, in, in David, we were sort of talking about before, but Goldman Sachs has announced, they're now a software vendor, right? Uh, uh, Capital One is a software vendor. I'd be really interested Liberty to see what Mutual. Cerner does, with, with what Oracle does with Cerner in, in terms of them becoming super cloud vendors and monetizing, that to me is, a, that is their digital transformation. Do you guys, do you guys see that in the customer base? Am I way too far out of my, of my skis there? I think it's two different things. I think I think basically it's the idea of building applications that they monetize. Yeah, they're, and Cerner's going to build those. And you know, I think about like you know IoT companies that sell that sell uh, or, or you think people that sell like you know thermostats. They sell an application that monetizes those thermostats. Mm -hmm. Some of that runs on Amazon. Some of it runs on a private data center. So they're basically in composite applications and monetize, monetizing them for the particular vertical. I think that's what we see each and every day. That's what we yeah, you can, yeah, you can argue that's not, not anything new, but what's new is they're doing that on the cloud and taking Across multiple clouds. Multiple, multiple clouds. exactly. That's and, what makes and it super edge. cloud. And edge. Yeah. And I think what and we edge. all participate in is, hey, in order to do that, you need to drive standardization of how you do provisioning, how you do networking, how you do security to underpin those applications. I think that's what we're all talking about. Guys, this is great yeah. stuff, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to Thank help you. us continue the conversation, to put out in the open. We want to keep it out in the open. So in the last minute we have left, let's go down the line from a HashiCorp perspective, Confluent and VMware. What's your position on SuperCloud? What's the outcome that you would like to see from your standpoint going out five years? What's it look like? Okay, we'll start with you. I just think people like, sort of underst understanding that there is a layer by layer view of how to interact across the clouds to provide operational consistency and decomposing it that way, thinking about it that way is the best way to enable people to build and run apps. We want to help our customers uh, work with their data in real time, regardless of where they are, on-prem or in the cloud, and uh, SuperCloud can enable them to build applications that do that more effectively. That's, that's great for us. Vittorio? I, my Nirvana for us is uh, customers don't care. It's just, there's computing out there, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a tool that allows me to grow my business, and we make it all, These are all the differences and all the, the challenges, you know, Disappear. Dial up compute, utility, yeah. infrastructure as code. I open up the faucet <laughs> as there's water coming out. Yeah, I don't care how it got, I, how it got here. <laughs> I don't want to care. Well, thank you guys so much and congratulations on all your success in the marketplace, both you guys and VMware and your new journey. And it's going to be great to watch. Thanks for participating. Really Thanks, appreciate guys. it. Thank you. Sir. Okay, this is SuperCloud 22, our inaugural event. It's a pilot. We're going to get it out there in the open. We're going to get the data. We're going to share with everyone out in the open on siliconangle.com and thecube.net. We'll be back with more live coverage here in Palo Alto after this short break. <laughs>